things. Okay, so our first talk of the day is going to start presently. We have Skylar Town giving his, pre what's your presentation called? X-Locks. X-Locks. <laughs> sort of like X-Files, but with locks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm a bit sick, so you'll forgive me if I have to turn to the box of Kleenex I got here at some point during the talk, but I'm pretty excited to be somewhat formally launching this project today. I launched, uh, I launched semi-publicly at BCon in Boston a few weeks ago. Since then, we've had some volunteers come on board, and we've started digging up some really great information. I'm going to break down what I'm talking about here in just a moment. All right, so I'm Skylar Town. Um, I'm super into locks. You can find me as at shoebox on Twitter, lock.gd. Um, but all I really want you guys to know today as far as how to get in touch and what to know about the project is this address, x.lock.gd. x.lock.gd. Um, lock.gd, I pronounce it lock god. It's my personal URL shortener. You pronounce it however you like. Uh, but that's where the xlock project is hosted at x.lock.gd. The idea here is that in 1836, there was a fire at the patent office which destroyed somewhere on the order of 10,000 different patents, of which uh, around 20% of those were able to be recovered. In that mix were a lot of lock patents. Um, none of the lock patents have been fully recovered, though we do have uh, letters patent for a few, images for a few, um, and we're working on transcribing some of that, etc. But for very many of these, we have nothing at all. So. The push to recover all of those patents from the patent office fire ended not long after the fire was put out. They just sort of moved on, created a new structure for taking on new patents, asked people who had lost patents to resubmit, and that was about the extent of it. Um, after a decade or so, pretty much everybody just stopped trying. There are a few independent projects or independent people that have come across patents as the years have gone on and have restored these things to the database. But, as locks are the thing that I care most about in this world, for those patents that are locks, I am making it my personal mission to restore as much information as possible about every one of the locks that we lost in that fire, to restore whatever the patent office will accept, uh, restored to the patent um, record, and aside from that, as they're not going to accept absolutely everything that I'm finding, I'm also going to try to build out a resource at x.lock.gd, for other researchers and for people that even just have a passing interest in all of this. So, to dig in. Uh, this was the patent office uh, back in the early 1800s, before it started burning all the time. Um, the, uh, the patent office went through several fires. Uh, it came very close to being burned down in 1814, when all the rest of Washington was burned down. But this guy, who was the commissioner of patents at the time, said to some British soldiers, "Hey." Can you guys please help me protect this one building and just burn everything else, please? This has real importance to mankind. And he was able to talk the soldiers into actually helping him protect this against the other British soldiers as they were burning the rest of Washington. So we survived that, only to burn down a few years later in the Patent Office Fire of 1836, 20 years later. But um, despite the horrible threat to Washington, well, no, I can't really say this. So. Uh, um, the building burned down and we lost a lot of stuff and that sucked. They weren't completely ignorant about what they needed to be doing for the patents at this time. As a matter of fact, it burned down in a transitional space while it was being moved from a not very fire resistant building to a fireproof building. And it burned down in the interstitial space, which was also not fireproof. Um, this, if you are a Fires of the Patent Office scholar, you will know that this actually is not the Patent Office Fire of 1836. This is the Patent Office Fire of 1877. Seriously, the building burned a lot. Um, there would be several other smaller file fires and then other fires of the National Archive. This is the, um, this is the Patent Office built after the Fire of 1836. This is the one that would later burn in 77. So, a lot of burning, a lot of fire, a lot of dead, ruined patents. <clears throat> so. This project then, as I was saying at the start, is to try to recover as many of the lock patents specifically. Um, there are a ton of patents and there are a ton of people that have done really excellent work in trying to recover as much information about those patents as possible. And to that end, I'm actually relying on the legwork of one of those groups. 
um, the Directory of American Tool and Machinery Patents. Um, this was a couple of different mail serves where a bunch of old tool and die guys were very, very interested in the history of tools made in America and some international as well. And so they went through and they actually documented as a volunteer project every single tool related patent. Thankfully for me, this also includes, at least in antiquity, locks. So these guys have a comprehensive record of all of the, all of the patents that were lost to the fire. Now, just because they have the patent number and the name of the assignee of the patent doesn't mean that they have any other information, but they at least have that having gone through the roles of the records of the patent office that managed to survive even if the patents themselves didn't. <clears throat> so, they have a pretty good uh, setup here. We're going to go ahead and look for some lock patents. All right, so... Looking for lock patents, you're going to come up with a lot of clock patents. Clocks were also a big boom industry back in the day, uh, to the point, actually, that there were at least one and anecdotally two different clockworks in the state of Connecticut that, as locks became a boom industry, just went out and knocked the C off the building, changed their machinery a little bit, and became, clock and became lockworks. Um, not that that helps us at all. So, let's see. Let's have a look at pie here. Uh, so this is William Pye. Um, on the construction of locks, you'll see the same guy has another patent in the X series. This is why they're called the X locks. Everything before 1836, uh, whether recovered or not recovered whatsoever, has been given a number designation followed by the letter X. There are a couple others that will have special designations on top of that, like FX or NX or PX. Um, but all of it is to say that these burned and we may or may not have anything recovered from them whatsoever. And then the patent office started again at one after that and built back up to what it is today. Um, so one of the things that I want to mention about Detamp here, um, they've done a lot of great work. Uh, but because they're working off of historical roles and if there's no recoverable information about the patent, they kind of stop there. Sometimes basic things, even like last names, aren't actually entirely correct. Now, admittedly, I need to at some point report data errors or omissions to these folks because they provide me a way to. So I am not complaining. It is entirely on me to provide them this information. Um, but in the case of William Pye, William Pye is actually P-Y-E. Um, and there's a good amount of biographical information about the Pyes. And we'll actually talk about them in a little bit. But right now we have no recoverable anything. They link off to Google Patents and the US Patent Office images, um, but all they've done is just filled in the basic information that that query needs. It doesn't actually mean that there's anything there. Um, frequently there will be something there, but in this case we got nothing. <coughs> all right, so this Zotero is the tool that I am using for all of my research. Um, Zotero is pretty slick. It provides a means of quickly saving any interesting thing that you find from the internet, from any of your searches, through JSTOR or Google Patents, or even if it's just a random web page, you can get a nice snapshot of it with a lot of details, and then you could add annotations, tags, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in particular, because I want this to be a fairly public project, we're actually keeping a public, and we'll go back to here. We're actually keeping a public database of everything that we're doing. So any time that I or somebody else that's working on the project right now finds a new interesting piece of information, we save it to our local Zotero client, we add tags or any other information that it needs, and as soon as we sync back up to the server, it's available for everybody to see what we're finding. So right now, there is just a ton of stuff. And it's relatively well organized if you actually go deep into the group library. This, by the way, is zotero.org slash groups slash x dash locks. Um, and in the group library you can see that it's much better structured by each of the individual patents. Some of them don't have much information yet. Some of them have a good amount of information. Um, but this is where you can follow the project in a just data-driven way to see what we're finding every single day. Okay. Um, let's go back, though, and talk about... Yes, these guys, the Campbells. Excellent. <clears throat> so, 
When we're looking into the patent record, uh, as I said at the top, some things have been recovered at least partially. We have maybe the letters patent in a scan. We maybe have some illustrations. In some cases, we might have a, a little bit of both, which is fantastic. In the case of the Campbells here, we actually got very lucky. And uh, if we follow this through to the Google link, we not only have one decent drawing from the drawing specifications, but we also have a relatively clear scan of the letters patent. Now, there's never been a transcript made of this, so this is one of the first things that I began working on myself. And now, on the Zotero page, we have a note appended to this entry for the Campbells, where you can actually read the full text transcription for their patent. Um, this describes in full how they expected it to operate, and then I, to provide a little bit of context, just wrote some notes in the abstract explaining the basics of how it operates. We're going to get back to the Campbells in a minute, because that actually gets more exciting as we go along. But, <clears throat> for now, let's talk about the transcription process. Um, throughout this project, I'm looking for volunteers to help me with transcription, to just help me with general research. I will assign you a name of one of these inventors, and you're going to find out as much as you can about them, and dump it into Zotero, and it would be amazing. Um, people that are helping with access to databases, 3D printing, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, we have a couple people right now working on transcription. So this here, we're going to start right here, and we're going to end down here. This reads, the lock may be of any form or dimensions, and the size and form of the wire should be varied accordingly. However, so the lock may be of any form or dimensions gets a little bit lost, but you can probably make that out just contextually. These are just really crappy little ampersands. Um, which confused the person that was helping me transcribe this initially. The size and form of the, this totally looks like right or white or whatever the case may be, but again, as you dig into the transcription and do a couple of these, you'll realize that there is a lot of common language, and so I can reasonably guess that that is wire. And you'll see wire pop up over and over again. For some reason, he always crosses the R in his wire with the end of his E, so it always looks like white or right or something like that. But again, after you've done a couple of these, um, so if you're interested in working on transcriptions, I will happily look over your shoulder as you're doing your first one to kind of give you an idea of the language of the, of the time and of the subject matter. Should be varied accordingly, et cetera, et cetera. Great. And that totally looks like if, but it's of. No real secret on that. Just doesn't make sense if it's if. OK. <laughs> uh, this is one of the gentlemen helping me right now with transcriptions. I have another one. This guy has actually submitted a couple of uh, committed full transcriptions to the project so far. Chris French Jr. Uh, Turtle Up with a three instead of an E on Twitter. Uh, really good guy. Met him at a conference a couple of years ago, and he's um, been a good friend ever since. Uh, and has You will see a couple of his submissions in the Zotero project from transcriptions that he's worked on. Got another guy that has just had a bunch of them assigned to him, so hopefully he'll be getting bit some great stuff back to me soon. And a couple other people doing some uh, database diving to, in databases that I don't have access to right now. All right, so sometimes we... Um, Oh, this is, uh, sorry, this is actually just one of his transcriptions, just so you can see one of the things that he has contributed to this for Joe, uh, yeah, Joe Baker. Now, we don't, can't always understand absolutely everything, so even if all you want to do is take an afternoon and go through and read through one of the transcriptions already there to see if you catch something that we didn't, that would also be awesome. That's a big hand for us. <clears throat> Sadly, some of our scans look more like this. And... If you don't have any original to go off of, um, so this is one's going to be harder. I am yet to assign this to either of the people working on transcriptions because I think what we actually need is somebody who does image analysis work to some degree to see if they can bring out any of the lettering and get rid of any of the junk there. So if you're interested in that, we need people for that as well. All right. The Campbell's Lock, we had mentioned this before. Um, So, it's fairly slick in the way that it operates. <clears throat> this, these are two wheels that will face outward. We're looking at the back side of a lock that would be installed. This is the bolt assembly with the bolt currently thrown. This is the only part that protrudes into the frame of the door. This is just a stop, so it's stopped against the interior wall of the lock. And then this here, let me zoom a little. This here will actually block 
the bolt mechanism from pulling back into the lock itself. It will block it until this bar that runs along that blocking mechanism can fall into the two true gates of these two combination wheels. So what's happening is that each of the notches in these wheels are false gates except for one. So they're not quite deep enough, but it'll still feel like you've set the bar in place. Across the two wheels, there are seven false gates, one true gate on each of them. You need to have them both aligned properly so that that bar can pull into place. This can slide against the face of the lock itself, and this bar will now slide over that because there's a little bit of clearance between the bolt, mechanism, the bolt assembly and the face of the lock. So this pushes toward the face of the lock. They actually recommend that you have some sort of tool to pull it in because they didn't bother putting a spring on it or anything. Um, so you pull it into position and then the bolt can slide back with a key operated through here, pulling on that, pushing it in that direction. So it's kind of neat, but just looking at it initially, I had no idea what it was until I was able to get the transcription done and read through it. They have another iteration of a similar idea down here um, that I'm not going to get into right now um, because this is sort of the, the showpiece of the talk right now. Now, uh, from a modern security perspective, this can absolutely be opened. Um, I can completely figure out where the true gate is, uh, uh, you know, against the false gates. Um, the... There is no additional security in the key space whatsoever. This is basically just a big slug of metal that's going to spin and pull that bolt mechanism in. This is not particularly high security, but it is damn clever. And it's really neat. And it's something that hasn't existed outside of this guy's mind and the fiery ashes of the patent office for a very long time. And there are a few things that excite me more than digging back into the history of security, back into the history of locks and keys and brass and grease and mechanical engineering and plucking out a little piece of truth that got lost somewhere along the way and say, look at what this super clever person came up with. Isn't that cool? And we're actually gonna keep coming back to the Campbell lock throughout the talk. I have a little more to say about it as we go. Um, so this is, I believe, James Kyle. Now with James Kyle, we have no letters patent whatsoever, but we have other resources than just continuing to hit the patent record and hoping that something's been recovered. It's actually rare that anything has been recovered. So in the case of James Kyle, we're actually lucky enough to have an image, but we have no letters patent to explain what we're looking at here whatsoever. But thankfully, it was of enough interest to folks at the uh, Journal of the Franklin Institute of the State of Pennsylvania to describe for us its function. Uh, and there are a couple, this, this lock in multiple forms has been described in a couple issues of the journal. Um, but here we have, reading at 26 in particular, for an improvement on the door lock for which the preceding patent was obtained, James Kyle, blah, 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 blah. We mentioned the lock upon which this is an improvement in very favorable terms and those alterations which experiences suggested in it have certainly rendered it much more perfect for the lever latches working upon a fulcrum and raised by the key of which we spoke particularly, et cetera, et cetera. But then it concludes with, as we have formerly observed, formerly observed, a drawing would be required to render its construction intelligible but we have a drawing. So we can actually use their multiple descriptions of this lock, which they had never provided an illustration for, and the one thing that was recovered in the patent fire for this lock, and we're able to put them together and get a real understanding of how that lock works. Now, the patent office probably is not going to have any interest in accepting a general description of how the thing operated in place of letters patent. At no point in time do I expect the United States Patent Office to take James Kyle's drawing and add my or my project's description of how it worked to their records. And that's the other important thing about this project is that I want it to stand for a long time. I want it to stand for an indefinite amount of time. Because the patent office is going to have stringent controls on what can be considered patent literature, I want to be able to describe fully how a lock worked that we no longer have from the patent office even if they're not going to publish it. So we're going to keep this information available at x.lock.gd. In fact, I would even like to build out an API so that people can just dig in and get structured information about each of the X locks that we have available to us. And maybe at some point in time, if this project works out as well as I would dream that it would, after, after however many years it will take to get this exactly where I would want it, maybe the structure of all of this would be the sort of thing that other people doing patent diving could use 
to, if not fully recover patents, to at least fully describe and explore patents and their inventors. Okay, now this is another interesting situation where we actually have no recovery whatsoever from the United States Patent Office, but in the case of Abraham Oeger Stansberry, um, his invention was very, very important, and he patented it in England as well. And his letters patent from England are in perfect shape. So this is um, specification of the patent. To all whom these presents shall come, etc. Know now ye that in compliance of the said provisio, I, the said Abraham, etc., etc. There is even more flowery language than ours. There is something under there to catch this. <laughs> Um, so this goes on for a very long time. I'm not going to read all of it to you. The reason that this is important, actually, um, you can see this in other talks of mine, but a guy named um, uh, Vivant Denon went to Egypt with uh, Napoleon. When Napoleon was trying to conquer Egypt, he discovered the, uh, the pin tumbler lock of antiquity. Turns out this thing had been around for thousands of years. He comes home, talks about it, gets translated into English, and this guy Stansberry says, oh, that's awesome. I am going to patent it. Um, and so he files a patent for a version of what he refers to in the, um, at least in the American specification as the Egyptian lock. So this is an important moment in the history of pin tumbler locks and the history of security in general. But anyway, we have a long drawn out perfectly collected um, letters patent from the British office which had different standards, admittedly, than the American office. I do not know this would be a finer line. I do not know if the United States Patent Office would be willing to reprint the British specifications that were provided at around the same time for exactly the same lock. We cannot know, or I shouldn't say we cannot know, but I don't know, and it turns out that it's really hard to, really hard to report a bug in Google patents and really hard to get in touch with anybody at the Patent Office in order to <coughs> help them recover a patent. But, I'm working on that as well. Um, anyway, all of the scrolling is for something right here. Excellent. So we also have a drawing of his lock and the way that it was meant to operate. And it is actually significantly different than the Egyptian lock of antiquity. Um, this guy desperately tried to get these things produced in England, and it went really, really poorly. Poorly. Um, the inventor of this lock, an American, came over to this country in 1805 and patented it. And it was very assiduous, and was very assiduous in endeavoring to get it introduced, in which attempt, however, he met with so little encouragement that it might be deemed a failure. Um, and really, except for, you know, the, the very specific and excited interest of historians, it was a complete failure for him as a, as a you know, security and financial endeavor. Um, so, how does the recovery process work? Uh, I've just searched for this fairly specific term because I didn't want to leave myself an actual paper note and now I have it in the middle of my talk and I'm making it terribly awkward by pointing out that I left myself notes in the middle of my talk. So, here's how the recovery process works. Um, if you are working with me or if I am working with myself, usually I very specifically will go into work with my fiance to her barista job at Starbucks at 5.15 in the morning and I will sit at that Starbucks and research a single person for about eight hours, just trying to dig up as much information as possible. Every time I come across a page, um, I have my Zotero Thick client open. Um, so there's a Zotero client for your personal workspace. You will use it yourself, and then you will sync it to the server. Um, what the Thick client allows you to do is, as you're browsing around places, you can save the Zotero, sna save the Zotero snapshot from current page, and this will always save into whatever subfolder that you're looking at. So if today is the day that I'm going to try to find out as much about Jay Brown as I possibly can, I go into Jay Brown and I just go to town with various resources that I have available to me. Now, once I decided that I wanted other people to start helping me out with this, I also collected all of those resources into the Zotero group page. So right up here in First Pass resources, we have Detamp, which we've already looked at. We have Google Patents, which we've already looked at. Google Books is where a couple of the passages that I just read came from. That's where we find the British specification for Stansberry's lock. Um, a lot of good stuff can be found in there, and you can very easily limit your searches to pre-1900, even pre-1836 specifically, if that's what you want to do. Um, I have a ton of good information. Archive.org is fantastic as well. There's no good reason I don't have that up here right now. Um, all right, so I want to talk about these other two, though. Family Search and Fulton History. Um, and then 
Well, I'll just cover this very quickly. This is just a collection of dozens and dozens and dozens of mostly small community or university projects to collect databases of their local newspapers. So this is local newspapers that go back to the range that we are researching that you can go through and try every single name out on and go comb through these databases and hope to find something. There are situations where somebody will have been popular enough in their day that you are going to get hits in just about anything in New England because you will be seeing the same ad in a newspaper over and over and over again and you spend three hours of your life and a triple grande peppermint mocha trying to find any new piece of information and it is super, super boring work until those moments when you do find something interesting and then you are reaching back into the depths of history to rip some truth up into the present and that's how you should feel about it, to keep yourself excited and then go get another mocha because you're getting tired. All right, so um, the newspaper and magazine archives, this is self-explanatory. It's dozens and dozens and dozens of them. This is not every newspaper and magazine archive that is available for the United States, um, but these are the ones specifically that I have found that go back to the date ranges that we are trying to investigate. Anyway, back to first pass resources. Let's quickly look at um, Family Search here. Um, so Family Search is actually sponsored by the Mormon Church. Um, the Mormons, if you did not know this, have been going around for a very long time trying to create a perfect genealogy of America and other nations as well. Um, but I remember when I was a very little kid, they came to our city hall and there were literally just people taking microfilm pictures of everybody's like birth and death and census records that we had in our town. And I remember my mother being like, oh, the Mormons are here. Um, and I was like, oh, that's what Mormons do. That's all I knew about Mormons for most of my life. Um, but in the recent years, they have made this information available to any genealogical historian, researcher, historian, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a phenomenal resources, free source for trying to pin down biographical information about these inventors. Now, this is not their locks, and nothing that we find out biographical is going to be worth anything to the patent office. But as you're hopefully discovering, the deeper we go into this talk, restoring the patents to the patent office, as exciting as that is as an end goal, is far from my ultimate goal. I want to be able to tell the stories of every single inventor. I want to be able to tell the stories of the invention of every single one of these locks. The people that are involved in this are just as interesting as the things that they made. Um, and the, the anthropology is just as interesting to me as the mechanics of all of this. So, um, Family Search turns out to be a great resource for finding census data, for making sure that the guy that you're looking into, that you think is from the area that he's from, actually has anything on record to back that up. Um, early on, with the Campbells, that lock that I keep talking about that we're going to keep coming back to, I have found no genealogical information for the, Gam for the Campbells whatsoever from the area that they were supposed to be from. I have found nothing. They are ghosts. Perhaps the name is incorrect. Perhaps whatever it was registered under initially was incorrect. Um, whatever Daytamp did, whatever Google did, some piece of information somewhere along the line isn't quite right. And so I'm hunting, hunting, hunting to provide any sort of background biographical story to this group of people that made a really interesting lock. And I want that filled in just as much as I want to rebuild their lock from scratch. All right, so Family Search is a good resource, as are a lot of other genealogical databases, but this is the free one. This is the one that you can go to and spend your day on and dig around forever. Um, all right, so <clears throat> the other one is crazy. So this is Fulton History. Now, Fulton History, if we pull back over to here, yeah. So this is the website for Fulton History. Um, there is, this is one of my favorite parts down here. This is the guy's face with an extra eye and a bunch of little legs like a spider crawling around the internet. Um, there is a chat window here that you can't see very well that is mostly just people saying hello endlessly or nothing. Hello, Eric, hello. Hello, howdy kids, hi, 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 hello, hello, hello. Um, which is just, I mean, it's a little terrifying, this like, Anyway, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. It's very strange. But this guy has digitized more newspaper pages than any major private database. He has digitized more, private, more newspaper pages 
than, uh, govern than a, a, an archive, um, uh, the National Archives Project, to do the same thing. This guy, working by himself, has recovered more old newspapers than any of these other people. So whether or not his web design skills are eclectic, he, he is providing um, an absolutely amazing service. Now, it's primarily New York State, but he's been branching out in recent years. Um, the, the abilities that he has added in here with his OCR, everything is OCR'd, so it's all full text searching. It's not just pages. Um, let's look for something really specific here. Um, uh, we'll look for Hobbes, Charles Hobbes. This, this part is often painful. <laughs> um, one sec. All right. So for this search, all I've looked for is patent lock, just to see what we can come up with. Um, hopefully what I'm going to be finding in here is an old advertisement from 1874 here. <coughs> patent needle caskets, hearth and home, billiards tables, press makers. Oh, you know what? The needle casket has a patent lock attachment. Uh, so this is not for a patent lock manufacturer, but you get the idea and I'm going to move on. Uh, the basic idea is that Fulton History is an absolutely amazing resource that is not the easiest to work with, but with full text search, the ability to download PDFs of absolutely everything that you're looking at, completely unlimited queries, it's just you go and you can spend days and days doing this, and he has more pages than anybody else. He has more pages than many of the commercial ones put together. That said, he doesn't have everything that the commercial ones have, so we're going to talk about that as well. All right, so um, I've talked a lot about volunteerism, et cetera, et cetera. So I have people transcribing, and right now, now that I have two other people transcribing and myself, I'm actually not looking for any other transcription help unless people want to review the work that's already been done, which would be very helpful. Having a fresh set of eyes over something that three people have looked at and said, I have no idea what that says, would be great. Um, but as far as doing full transcriptions at this point, we're covered for now, I just don't want to spread my time out too thin assigning things to other people and then reviewing other people's work. Um, fellow researchers though, I have one person right now that I think is about to jump in to cover one of the names because he was doing some database searching for me um, with some subscription to archives that he had and was very frustrated because he couldn't find anything and so he said, but I didn't want to come back to you with nothing so I dug into this other database I have access to and I found this guy's name as a, as sort of a landmark for a piece of property in an old deed. Here's his name, does this mean anything to you? And as it turned out, this tiny, tiny little insubstantial piece of information was my second confirming document telling me where this guy that I haven't spent much time on yet lived. And not only where he lived, but because it was part of a deed agreement, I can pretty much narrow down exactly the like street, plot of land, etc. that this guy lived on now. And because it matches up with what I was looking at previously, I now know for certain it's my guy. I know for certain this guy is from my home state and not terribly far away from me. And it was really exciting. Just a tiny piece of information that this guy thought was nothing that he only looked for because he was frustrated at having found nothing is hopefully going to be the first of a number of just a, a landslide of information about this guy that I haven't been able to find anything else about yet. And that's the other thing, is that every time you find a little bit of information that doesn't seem like it's important about the figure we're looking for, let's talk about genealogy. You look at a census record, and sure, now maybe we know the name of the house that he was in, or the address, great. But we also have other members of his family. And we have other people that lived in that house. Maybe people that clearly aren't members of the family but, are, but had been living there. And we just have a new block of search terms that might at some point have some ancillary relationship to our primary subject and will be able to give us a lot more information about that. This is just 
I really can't emphasize enough how boring a lot of this is. <laughs> it is just a slog researching from point to point to idea to idea to idea. Um, and without Zotero to keep it all manageable and know that you're not covering the same bases over and over and over again, it's, it's miserable. This is the sort of work that I've done on my own for years now. And we'll go back two months later and say, oh, man, Pat Schuyler was super clever. He figured something really cool out that he took no notes about. I don't know where he found that, but it sure sounds right, and whatever else. So Zotero has been a blessing for all of this. I digress. Um, so fellow researchers, I would actually love this, and I would love more of this. Really, the assignment is simple. It says right there, all I am going to do is give you a name and a patent number for one of these people. There are a few dozen right now. And your entire life goal for some span of time is just to find as much information as you can that might be related to that person. Right now, all of this is a data dump. This project is going to happen in several stages. We'll talk about that later. But next up is curation. Next up is taking all of the information that I and anybody else that are helping with the project have found and curate it down into usable information. Um, along the way, the goal is to lose nothing except for things that are inaccurate where there are going to be false positives. There are a lot of people with the name James Kyle. There are a lot of people with some of the similar names. There aren't all that many Abraham Uyghur Stonsberries, thankfully. Um, but there are a lot of fairly common names in this. We're going to get a lot of false positives. And those are the only things we want to pull out permanently. Um, but we'll talk about all of that in the curation process later. Academic resources. Consistent access to JSTOR would be amazing. I've never been to college. I probably won't go to college. Um, I <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, I am presently also a barista. My fiance and I both were the caffeine power couple of South Burlington, Vermont. A lot of jittery makeout sessions. Um, <laughs> not true. Um, the University of Vermont, as part of their mission to the state and the citizens of the state, provide all of the academic resources of the University of Vermont library to any citizen, whether or not they go to UVM, which I think is awesome, and I wish happened more often. But what it means for me is that I can roll into UVM, and I can spend a day digging through JSTOR, digging through all of their access to various journals, other libraries, et cetera, et cetera, their own. Um, I found some phenomenal information in their actual private paper records that led me to some new leads on some of the different inventors. Um, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal thing. But going in to spend a day at UVM is becoming harder and harder for me as I'm hopefully transitioning into a real job again, as I'm trying to keep track of the other parts of this project and so on and so forth. Being able to do some of these things from the privacy of my own home is phenomenal and to that end, um, I've had at least one person now provide me some JSTOR access via them. They'll just let me send them things to look into and then they'll shoot me, thank you, and they'll shoot me a bunch of PDFs um, for me to then dig through and sort of curate the information out of. Any Academic affiliation would be amazing. I am very proud to have recently been named a research scholar at the Ronan Institute. There are 501c3 that provide, independent, that provide um, institutional backing to independent academics. Most of the people that are involved in this have been to college. In fact, they are professors. They have doctorates, on and on and on. What the Ronan Institute is allowing me to do right now is put their name down in the institution field for grants and for papers that I'm submitting to more academic conferences and so on and so forth. That said, I don't actually have the academic resources of an institution of higher learning behind me and behind this project. If you are in that position or if you know somebody in that position that wants to throw the weight of a school behind this, that could potentially be amazing for this um, and give us access to a lot more information than I privately have access to right now. Um, and subscriptions to archives I've mentioned in passing a couple of times, but if you have a subscription to Genealogy Bank, Newspaper Archive, Fold3, Ancestry.com, any of those places, any other paid genealogy, history, newspaper archive site, it would be amazing if you'd be willing to run down some search queries for us. Even a few a week, a few a month, one ever, anything would be amazing. <clears throat> okay. So. I said that I would get back to the Campbells, and I said that I would get back to the pies. And I'm going to cover both of those in about five minutes. The pies, I don't have a lot of information in the Zotero database right now, but it's the pies that got me interested in this to begin with. And this is past Skyler. This is Skyler that didn't take good notes. This is Skyler that was, to be perfectly honest, and some people in this room I'm sure are already aware of this, but this is past Skyler that was crazy enough that he ended up in a mental institution. 
And I was doing some of the best work in my life when I was this crazy, and now I'm trying to use Zotero instead of craziness to be able to maintain it. Um, and it seems to be going really well. But looking back on this is what got me very excited because the Pies and the Whaleys, who are two of the names that we have, I was able to find a ton of information about and I was able to tell the story of this family, of these two families, that were one of America's first locksmithing and lockmaking families but have been, as best I can tell, completely forgotten about. There are a couple of Pie patent railroad locks kicking around in the old collector's collections. But this story, to the best of my knowledge, has never been told. This is an unpublished essay that will eventually be published, maybe in a book, maybe in something else, but I just want to read the uh, last paragraph here. Basically, these turned out to be two incredibly interesting families that made amazing locks. They won medals for their locks, but their buildings burned down. They didn't make the newest type of lock. They carried over old British traditions instead of switching over to some new American traditions. They didn't pivot rapidly. Their children stopped being interested in the business. For one reason or another, after four generations of trying to make it work, they just completely faded into history and were never heard from again. But we can tell four generations of the life in these two families here. I conclude with, while it's easy to recognize the visionaries, I find myself fascinated by the stories of generations of lockmakers who toiled in relative obscurity, working hard and nudging the art forward. They just happened to be working in a moment that was filled with rapid, bold, and public innovation, and as a result, their masterworks were left in the dust of history. And that's the nut of the whole project for me. And I've said this several times, but um, I want to go back to the Campbells one more time here. So, the Campbell patent we've already looked at, we've looked at the full text transcription. I've started taking the patents that we have images for and just started building vectors of them in Illustrator. And, you know, eventually I end up with something that looks like this. And this is raw SVGs I can then bring into Blender and I can actually build out 3D models and 3D animations of these locks. And using tools that work with Blender or using other software other than Blender, we can actually 3D print these locks. And I have a mini mill in my home so I can build these out of brass and grease again as they were meant to be made. And I tell you, there has been nothing more exciting in my career picking locks, researching locks, speaking in anything I've done in my life than holding a tangible artifact of lost genius in my hand. Preach, brother! <laughs> and if you help me, even if you just watch and encourage and tell other people about it, we'll have more and more of these artifacts in our hands. We are going to drudge up the masterworks of makers that have been completely forgotten. And hopefully, someday when all of us are dead, someone will do the same thing for us. X.lock.gd. This is my new life. Come help me out. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think I might still have a minute or two for questions if there are any questions. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> you go right ahead. An old lock. Did they practice putting the patents on them back then? Yes. Um, so the question was, if you find an old lock, will you often see patent markings on them? Um, yes, to a degree. At the very least, you'll usually see the word patent. Um, during this time, the idea of having a patent lock was almost synonymous with how people now think of like, oh, well, you better get a deadbolt. Um, it was the same idea, where patent lock, lock was just a buzzword for better secure than a random lock. So at the very least, it should say patent on it, whether or not it'll have any number associated with it. But even just that would be a great, um, I mean, having that on a physical artifact would be a great uh, way to get started digging deeper into that particular patent. There are people out there that know a lot more about old locks than I do. I have the pleasure of speaking at the Lancaster Lock Show in several weeks, where it is just hardcore antique lock collectors, and it is a very different audience than I've been in front of before. I'm going to be talking about this project and a couple other things, um, and I'm very excited to have those guys, because those are the sort of people I would bring some random lock that somebody found and say, all right, what's going on with this? Where do we start? Because there, there's still some great collected information out there. How much time did it take to machine the lock out of brass? 
Um, so I, ha I have not yet machined the Campbell's lock out of brass. I have machined locks out of brass before. Um, the first time I ever tried to do it, it was terrible, it went poorly, and it took a very long time, and it didn't work, and I threw it away. Well, I didn't throw it away, it's brass. Um, brass costs a lot still. Um, the, the only other time that I've attempted, and I actually made a very simple lever lock, very small, simple lever lock out of a plate of brass. It took me about three days. I would guess that I was working between four and eight hours each day. I also didn't have a great sense of what I was doing, but as each one of these locks will be unique and more and more complex than the very simple thing that I worked on, when it comes time to actually make it out of brass, I don't have a great estimate for how long that'll take me. I mean, I want to laser cut things, I want to 3D print things, but at some point in time, I want the machined brass, greased springs, etc. because, I mean, I've said, I've said it at many talks, it's not unique for me, but the smell of brass and grease is invigorating to me, just in and of itself. It, it is, I got nothing, yeah, yes? Models were made for the uh, patent office? <clears throat> so, uh, this is a great question and a good point. I didn't mention this. Model, uh, before the patent office burned, every patent that was submitted have to ha had to have a model submitted with it. Unfortunately, we lost all the models in 1836. In the 1877 fire, we lost a ton of the models again. Um, I don't know the specific metals. Some, sometimes they would just be made out of wood just to explain how the thing worked. Um, I don't have the specifics for how any one of our 40-something locks were created in the model. I don't have that information. Yeah. Yes, one more. Were they cast instead of machine? Uh, most of them back then were cast, yes. Yeah, absolutely. So hand work finished them? Yeah, handwork, a lot of iron. The, the main reason that I want to do them out of brass and on my machine presently is because that's what excites me. And it's a passion project. If anybody out there wants to do actual, like, casting, forging, etc., they are welcome to it. And I will send along any plans that I make for myself as well. That would be awesome. If there's a blacksmith out there that wants to get involved, that would be crazy. That would be very cool. Earlier. Yes. Now, have, uh, I don't know if this would be a, a rude or anything, but have you tracked down any of the families? Um, the question is whether I've tracked down any of the families. Uh, I actually skipped over this just because I was running low on time, but yeah, I absolutely have. Um, so these are the Manilis. Um, now, this Manili guy, we have no recovery whatsoever of anything from the patent office. This is, again, most commonly the case. Um, we have a couple of memoirs of people in his families. Uh, in his family, we have, uh, we know that he was, I think, a soldier at one point in time. He was part of a repeal association. We have all these little tiny bits of biographical data, but it turns out he was from a very famous bell-making family. And we have a little note in the Journal of the Franklin Institute that explains that the method, they, it, it talks briefly about the uh, way that he was casting his locks. And so immediately I'm wondering if there's any connection to the bell foundry, because this is what his family was in. Was he developing a new method for casting locks based on bell works? There were a lot of locksmiths that were also bell hangers back then, as it turns out. Um, so I got a hold of um, this gentleman who runs the Manili Bell Online Museum. He is a Manili. Sadly, he's never gotten a hold of it. He's never gotten back to me with my inquiries. Um, so, uh, honestly, having other people that are willing to go that extra mile to get a hold of current descendants, that would also be amazing, primarily because reaching out to randos, getting on the phone with people, sending people emails, etc., causes a little bit of an anxious reaction in me, so I don't do it very, very often. Um, and I would love more people to sort of pick up the things that will push me away from the project like anxiety attacks. Um, so that would be great. And yes, I have tried to reach out and I will continue to try to reach out. Um, getting personal papers would be an amazing boon to the project. So there's something over here with something back there. No, you go right ahead. Have you contacted the history on uh, detectives? For no, I have not. The PBS show folks? Yeah. <laughs> That's not a bad idea actually. I hadn't, uh, uh, because this had been a personal passion for a few months, and carried on from my historical work that I've been doing for years, and only just now I've made it public. I, I haven't even really thought about who else I could, who else in a, in a much more public way I could try to rope into this. So that's a good idea. Something over here? Okay. All right, thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. I'm actually gonna go back to bed for an hour. 
and then I'll be back down and whooping it up with all of you. Please come to me with any questions, and I'm really easy to get a hold of. Thank you.